And so Run Kenyan is also about what does it mean that even sometimes you might want to be a runner, but it's okay to mix it with other sports, like just being aware of your body and saying, okay, maybe I'll walk and I'll swim. And that's perfectly fine because you understand the impact of, let's say, running on pavement and things like that. And so ultimately we want Run Kenyan to be the embodiment of all these things so that when people come, they come to run with joy, they come to have a running community, they come with patience and humility and excellence, like showing up and as Enda means, you know, keep going. What's up Unfound Nation? Dan Kihanya here. Thanks so much for checking out another episode of Founders Unfound. That was Navalayo Osembo, co-founder and CEO of Enda, a company that is building on Kenya's reputation as the global leader in distance running. With Run Kenyan as its motto, Enda makes running shoes in Kenya for runners around the world. I'm so excited about this episode. Navalaya was the first guest we've had on from the place of my own ancestral heritage. Kenya, if you didn't pick that up. She grew up with a military father and a teacher mother, which meant strong themes of discipline and excellence. Combined with her gifts of curiosity, intelligence, and grit, she set out to master accounting, law, and eventually global development. But it was her return to Kenya from the U.S. and U.K., that helped her find the calling where she could make her impact, Run Kenyan. And so Enda was born. Navalayo has a great story. You'll definitely want to listen in. Our episode is sponsored by Aperture Venture Capital, a seed stage fund reimagining startup investing for the multicultural mainstream. Founding partners William and Garnett recently announced their inaugural $75 million first fund focused on diverse and female founders. But Aperture is double-clicking on changing the VC narrative. They also want to showcase the voices and stories of diverse entrepreneurs. Feel like you have a great story to tell? They want to share it at apertureVC.com forward slash founders. Head over to their site or look for a link in the show notes. And please make sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. We are available anywhere that you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, drop us a five-star review on Apple or at podchaser.com. And make sure to tell your friends about us. Now, on with the episode. Stay safe and hope you enjoy. Hello, and welcome to Founders Unfound, spotlighting the best startups you don't know yet. We bring you stories of exceptional founders from underrepresented and underestimated backgrounds. This is the latest episode in our continuing series on founders of African descent. I'm your host, Dan Kihanya. Let's get on it. Today, we have Navalayo Osembo, co-founder and CEO of Enda, a company that is building on and contributing to Kenya's reputation as the global leader in distance running. Enda makes running shoes in Kenya for runners around the world. Welcome to the show, Navalayo. We're super excited to have you on. Thanks for making the time. Awesome. Thanks for inviting me as well. I'm super excited to be here. Awesome. So we're going to obviously dive into the story of Enda. But before that, let's hear a little bit about you. What did you do before Enda? Where did you go to school? Where did you grow up? How did you grow up? I grew up in two different places. So in Kenya, you basically are in the city where your parents work. And then over the holidays, you go to the village where your grandparents are. So I kind of grew in between Nairobi and a place called Tarbo, which is about four, uh, a couple of kilometers from Eldoret. Eldoret is a place that is known as the city of champions. And so way before people kind of came to know about Kenyan runners, there was Eldoret and a lot of them typically make their investments in that city. So running that I was around me and my dad being in the military was also something that was in kind of like my growing up background. The military is very disciplined in terms of sports. And it's also one of the few employers in Kenya that actually hires athletes to to be athletes, not to, to do anything else. And so it's one of the reasons that I got exposed to runners at a very early age, although at that particular point, there were just people that I was familiar with, communities that I grew up in. I studied in Kenya for my basically high school and my undergrad. In my undergrad, I did law. So I have a law degree and I passed the bar and all that. And then I also did accounting. So I'm also a certified um, accountant. That was before I actually joined university because those days in Kenya I used to wait for like two years before university. Nowadays, these lucky kids don't have to do that anymore. So as a result of that, those two years I spent doing accounting before I did my undergrad. And then after that, I worked for a couple of years and then I did my postgraduate in London at the London School of Economics. 
Let's go back a little bit. So those are a lot of impressive things that seem to go in some different directions. But what were you like as a kid? Were you studious? Were you athletic? Were you musical? I would definitely say studious. You know, like I like books. I like reading. My mom was a teacher. And so there was no shaming her. You had to like be the best. <laughs> and uh, I, I'd say both of my parents were super strict on education and, and getting the best of that. So while I did enjoy writing and reading, I, I know my personality was more drawn towards books, studying, research, and things that are historical in nature. That makes sense. Did, did you have any sense of entrepreneurism around you or, or inside of you? I would say yes. You know, I look back at all the stuff I did or the stuff that I made my parents do for me, and I think it was there. There was one point I convinced my dad to put fish ponds in his beloved uh, I don't know how you call it. Is it a farm? A shamba? Is it a, okay, it's like a farm, you know? And so... I think we call them a garden here. Yeah, but then I feel like a garden is more the backyard garden, whereas this is more like lots, like land where you till to grow. And so the, the, having to convince him to basically forfeit his regular harvest to kind of like dig up ponds to, to grow fish was, um, you know, something that they did for me. Uh, fish farming. <laughs> they, <laughs> they did it? <laughs> they did. <laughs> They did. And it was good. I think we had challenges with it later. But um, at the very end, at least my parents had endless supply of domestic fish for them to eat whenever they want, even when that business didn't work out. So your dad had basically very large garden slash farm, small farm, and you convinced him to dig it up. It was producing vegetables and start farming fish. Yes. I actually went and got people who were interested in buying fish. I had the supply. I had everything lined up. The only thing I did not foresee was that someone would come and fish at night. Like it was that one thing you don't think about. And so that really, I think that really broke my heart. And so I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. Like it's insane to think of someone stealing fish at night. Like that was just an insane thing. And so after that heartbreak, I just told my parents, it doesn't have to be commercial, you know, they can just stay there. And if they want fish, they can literally go fish. I would say that's just one example of different things I did. I, I didn't see it as entrepreneurial. I just saw it as ideas that needed to be tried and tested. And so some didn't work, some did. But eventually, I think it's the spirit of trying different things and seeing what comes out of it. And how old were you? I must have been, I was still in university. So I must have been like about 21, 22 when, when we were doing this. Yeah. Nice. And so what, what attracted you to law? I have always wanted to be a lawyer since growing up. I don't know, maybe it's just uh, this fixation. I'm reading a lot of John Grisham novels and also kind of seeing a lot of law and order. You know how American TV shows permeate through the cultures of other countries. And so um, I knew that I wanted to be in law and I knew that I wanted, at least from a perspective of helping people, you know, um, navigate the justice system, get justice. You know, when you're young, you're really naive, you're really into we need to demand justice now and I was really into that like looking around me I just figured out there was so much injustice a lot of it governed by poverty and so I was like okay here's something I can do that's the career I wanted essentially that's how I ended up studying law. So you end up at the, the London School of Economics and so you get this amazing academic credentials where do you go from there? Okay, so London was a whole chapter, right? Like, I, I'm a huge tennis fan. And that was the first time I actually got to be, I would say, in the same space as the Williams sisters. I, I adore them. Like I, I, like, I have watched them for the longest time. And so London was the closest I was ever to them, even though they were, like, in another place. But I was like, you know what, we're breathing the same air. So, And so when I was there, the thing that really blew me away was kind of being in the space of Wimbledon, the Wimbledon championship and I looked around like from the spectators to the players and it really it hit me I was like where are the Africans you know like we are very athletic if I would say that like if you look at different sports uh, people of African descent are basically super athletic but in this one sport there were no Africans and so I started on a journey why are there no Africans on tennis and that led me down to a rabbit hole I visited a couple of tennis academies in the UK and I was like I know what I need to do I need to go home and start a tennis academy to get the next strategy that's gonna get into <laughs> these championships in the next 10 years and so 
I always say entrepreneurship is a mix of optimism and sometimes foolishness because I was like, this is possible. You could not convince me it wasn't possible. So I went back home. I thought that's after finishing my degree at LSE. And I, again, convinced my parents, uh, my brother actually this time, to give me a piece of land and to build a tennis academy there. So that was use my own savings, my own money, created like a school of bricks. And, you know, like it was a, a whole ecosystem I tapped into the tennis network in Kenya. I got the coaches and I was like, let's do this. Let's start making some champions. And then I realized what it takes to make a champion. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> it, was, it was really difficult. And at that particular point, I got a job offer with the UN in New York. And so I had to leave. And that was one of the challenges, basically trying to run a sports academy in a rural part of Kenya, not even in Nairobi. That would have been at least easier but in the semi-rural, like not really semi, like super rural and trying to organize that on phone was like difficult. The guys didn't even have like a mobile phone to take pictures, you know, <laughs> they would have to find someone who has a mobile phone with a camera to go and take the photos that I wanted. And so after some time, I realized they're not giving the kids the quality we promised. And so closed it, shelved it and figured out I shall do something else in future. And so when this didn't happen, I basically joined a business accelerator program because I was like, I want to know what I can be be do better next time. And in this particular program, they were like, tennis, hmm, interesting. You know, <laughs> that could be, I could tell they were like, are you insane? <laughs> but they helped me go through the theory of change and basically think, okay, if you want to, what do you want to do? I want to create huge social impacts. How do you want to do it through sports? Okay, let's go through it and figure out other ways you can work, even if it's not tennis. And that is how the idea of working in running came because I was like, wait a minute, like running is just that one thing that you don't need to explain to anyone, both Kenyans and non-Kenyans uh, about. And so that I would say was the beginning of Enda. And so tell us before we get to Enda, like how did you end up working in the UN? And I think you were in the United States, right? We're in New York where the UN is. Yeah. How, how did how did you end up with that experience? And I guess my second part of that question would be, I'm sure it was a great opportunity, but were you always thinking about the tennis academies done, but I'm on a, I'm going to be have the next thing coming soon? I don't think that's the thought process. I went in that accelerator to figure out how to make the tennis academy work, right? That was my thought. But I think it's more of being open to feedback and being open to the opportunities around you and also just looking at the lessons and figuring out, is this something I can overcome? No. So I can't go back to the same idea knowing that the challenges I had were simply not resolved and I was just going to bump to the next thing. So I think it's just a sequential, logical thought process of, okay, what next? Then, If this is not happening, what next? And that is how I ended up there. The UN job was simply that I literally just sent in an application because I was just also trying to figure out, okay, I need to pay my bills, I need to do stuff. And the, the tennis academy had taken all my savings uh, with all my naivety. So I was kind of like down to zero and I was like, okay, I need to find something to do, sent in an application. And yeah, I got a call for the interview process and it felt really, at some point I was like, this is fake. I, ha I hear people have super <laughs> horror stories of being swindled and stuff like that. But literally it was just that easy. Um, I always believe that in life, we, you don't need to win the race. You just need to be in the race. Sometimes you might be the best of the worst, you know, and sometimes we limit ourselves when we think, Anyway, that's what I tell myself anytime I'm applying for something and I'm like, I don't qualify for this, but I'm like, no, I'm going to be the. If I am the best of the worst, then at least they will see that I exist. And so that is how I ended up applying. I literally sent in my application two minutes before the deadline. I remember that very well and worked out. So I got the job, moved to New York with my family. It was a whole new experience, super experience. I'm a huge fan of the amazing race. Uh, I don't know if you've watched it, like I've watched it back to back, but it always amazes me, you know, like to travel, to see the world, but it's also the team dynamics. I think that's what really makes me happy about the show. And the last season, just before I moved, the last season, one of the last tasks was actually at the UN headquarters building. And so it was just mind-blowing that I had watched that and I saw them like trying to do all these uh, tasks in the UN building and then literally a few months later I was there looking at the same building and feeling like here I am I'm going to change the world you know I'm going to make world peace you know <laughs> I use my knowledge to act to the best of my ability 
And that's how I ended up in the UN. I was in New York for four and a half years. All this time, uh, the idea of Enda was growing. We were growing the team, having meetings, figuring out how to pivot product samples. So a lot of things were also going on the side, but the, the business literally just grew much faster than I had anticipated. And at some point, it became clear that I had to make a choice whether to pursue my career or to just go and try Enda with Enda and see how far it goes. And so being uh, the person who asked why not and not wanting to live with regret, I was like, you know what, I can always, probably I can get another job, right? So, but I wouldn't always have a company that has gained this much momentum. So let me see how much momentum we can do. And then if it works out, amazing. If it doesn't work out, you know what, we tried, you know, no regrets. And that is how I switched now from my job and moved back to Kenya to basically be full-time at Enda. Well, that's a perfect setup. We're going to hear more about the beginnings of Enda. But we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with Navalayo Osembo from Enda. I love that I'm building something, most importantly, that really matters, and that can change the world in a very relevant and necessary way. By being able to run my own business and be able to write my own check, as a lot of Americans would like to be able to do. I want to be able to be a bright, shining example of exactly how to make that happen. Hi, we're William and Garnett, founding partners of Aperture Venture Capital, VC for the multicultural mainstream. Aperture is a $75 million seed stage fund reimagining the startup landscape for diverse and female founders. If you're listening to this amazing podcast, you already know, diverse and female founders have largely been ignored by the VC industry. Aperture is making it our mission. We want to elevate those voices. So if you're a diverse founder, we want to showcase your story. Come share your voice and your founder's journey at ApertureVC.com forward slash founders. That's A-P-E-R-T-U-R-E-V-C dot com forward slash founders. Thank you very much. All right, we're back with Navalayo from Enda. Before we jump into Enda, though, I have a question. What What's your perspective on... So you, you grew up in Kenya and, uh, and we share, you know, my father's from Kenya and my uncle is in the Air Force and knows your, your father so that we have a connection there. Such a small world. <laughs> yeah. And, and so you went to the United States, so you, you were in London in the UK. What, what, was the, what was different about your perspective when you came back to Kenya? I'd say a lot of things. One, I feel like because London was my first experience outside of Kenya. I think that's the first time I experienced race, not racism, race. The awareness of being a black person, it was confusing, right? Like you kind of be in places and sometimes you feel like, okay, are these people looking at me or am I imagining things? <laughs> and I guess, you know, like not having the, the baggage of growing up in a system where you're very aware of race, I think in Europe is when I fully became aware that I am a black person. Like, yeah. And so... I think that was one of the things that made me think, okay, how do people navigate in this space? And how do you, how do you basically figure out how to navigate in places where you might, I don't know how to describe it. Like nobody would make you feel welcome, but you would feel different. And so that was the first time I kind of like experienced that. And then also we did have a class trip uh, to Geneva to, you know, like look at the international organizations and, and stuff like that. And I remember, I think my friends and I were like the only Africans on the flight. And these guys legit made us wait for everyone to like load in. And they were checking our passports and every page. And I know that was the day I was like, oh man, Africa really needs to get her, needs to get her act together, you know? <laughs> and so I would say that was it, like more of um, an awareness, but also a lot of questions like why, you know, why should we? I don't know how to describe it. It was more of a desire to seek excellence more, to pursue excellence, because I know, I know myself, no one needs to tell me that I'm not smart or anything like that. I feel like I'm beyond that. Like, I know who I am. But at the same time, I was like, how do you basically change the trajectory or the perception of what a continent is from both the people and also the people around? How do you change that? so that I can walk around anywhere in the world and not feel like people are shocked, surprised to see like a black person, you know? And so that was one of the things that I came back. I was like, okay, I want to do something good, but also very glad to land in Nairobi and be like, yay, no one's looking at me, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> and then there's also the element of NLC itself. I do have a bone to pick with international development, and I do think the discipline itself needs a review, I think, 
a lot of the research has been done from a perspective of studying Africa by non-Africans. And not that it, the stuff is incorrect, but I did find a disparity when people are talking about poverty, corruption, all these kinds of things. Not to say that they don't exist, they do. But I wouldn't necessarily call my childhood a childhood of, of luck. We didn't have much, but we, we had an amazing childhood. Like, it was amazing. And so to juxtapose what you would call poverty with what my experience of that poverty is, I'm like, yes, we need to help people. But at the same time, I am not miserable and wretched. You know, I, I am a full human being who enjoyed being in an environment with the ignorance, that the ignorance is bliss. And so it felt as though when you are creating a system of international development where you are training people to go and, you know, like a work in development, which is essentially Africa, Asia, uh, South America, people who are going to go into these spaces. But the feeling you're evoking from them is either pity or you are evoking a better than you attitude or evoking, I just feel like that's the wrong foundation to have for the international development perspective. Then you end up having a hierarchy, even at the local level, because the curriculum makes it sound like everybody is miserable and you're lucky to be able to serve them. I'm like, no, there has to be a different way to look at poverty, but without making it look so miserable. It's one of the thoughts that I'm still developing. I'm like, I should get serious and write like a, a book or something. <laughs> it's very deep. Yeah, some of the things I, I thought about and I was like, there is a way at which to look at the international development without adding on to the extra negative pressure or perception of what Africa is. And I just felt like that was already adding on to it. And anyone coming in was already coming, like I'm coming to save and to do all these things. And looking at the history of international development, if I look at Kenya, it's been over 50 years. Other countries have been over 60 years. Something is not working if you're spending all this money. And so the question was, okay, so what is the problem and how do we try to fix it? Very naive questions now that I know what I know. But uh, <laughs> those were some of the things that I came back home and I was like, the only thing I think, and I do believe the only thing people lack is opportunity. I've seen people hustle to the bone and I'm like, they just need opportunity. And I feel like that's the key thing that in Africa, in Kenya, and anywhere around the world where people are struggling, give them opportunity. And I think people will rise to the occasion. That's fascinating. And that's, I think people really can't appreciate enough just how different it is in the United States and in Western Europe, this idea of racial distinction. And, you know, it's almost as if you were like how tall you are around all the time and people were judging you by how tall you are. I know. And after some time, when everybody keeps on telling you, you're so tall, you're so tall, then in your mind, even if someone is looking at you and perhaps they're going to compliment you and say, what a nice t-shirt, you'll be like, oh my God, they're just going to say how tall I am, you know? And it is that thing that affects how people react and respond. And I think ultimately, yeah, we need to change as that as human beings. So tell us, like, so how, how did you get it started? I mean, you're, you're not a designer, I don't think. You're not, you're not somebody who has 25 years in the, in, the, in the shoe business. How did you actually get the business going? That's actually a good question, and I love it because I used to see, and I still see a lot of, uh, when you see people kind of like advertising for jobs and they'd be like, and that was something that used to annoy me so much, like 10 years of, of experience in this and that. And I'm like, there's two ways to look at life. There is one where you have curiosity and then there's one where you have the ways of, you know, like the true and trusted way of doing something. And I do think in this world, we need to keep a balance of both. And so I have no shoemaking experience, but I don't need to do that if I can get someone on my team who has the knowledge, the expertise, and, you know, the networks to be able to do that. And so that's something we figured out with my co-founder. I actually met him when I finished that accelerator program the last day. They had invited people who are interested in this space to come. And he was one of the people who were there. And we really talked a lot after my presentation. Like we had a serious conversation about what the opportunities are in terms of Kenyan branding. What was the thing that convinced him to come on board? How do I explain it? I think it's a feeling. And it was like a mutual feeling, if I would say that. Because he comes from a background of social change. So he had worked on at change.org before. He worked at the one campaign, which was Bono. I think it was under Bono at that particular time. And so his background is, how do we make the world a better place? Like, that's the kind of person he is. My background was like, how do we make Kenya a better space and Africa generally? 
And so when we met, it just felt like it was, what do you call, consensus and item. We had the meeting of minds that was basically like, okay, we, we do think we're in the same headspace. Uh, we had a really long chat after that. We had a really ch- long chat that day. We agreed to meet a week later. We met uh, at uh, for lunch and we stayed there until the place closed down. Like it was just ideas of like, we could do this and we could do this. And I, I think at that particular point, you could feel the connection and you could feel that we definitely were thinking along the same thought. uh, And it felt like a natural match, if I would say, like from a business perspective, it just felt like we were being driven by the same values. It felt like we were both in a place where we wanted to make change and in a place where we felt like each we could work together to be able to do this. And yeah, the rest is history. So yeah, so let's let's get to the starting point. So you decide that running is the heritage of Kenya and it's a great place to make make your mark and start a business. How how do you actually get it going? How do you come up with the design and the supply chain and I mean, how does that all come together? Ah, it's been a long journey. I would say the key thing I have learned is the team. You know, like you just need to have a good team around you and a team that you have each other's backs and I know that if Dan says he's gonna do X, he's gonna do X. If he can't figure it out, he's gonna say he can't do it and we'll figure out a way to do it. And so I would say that has been the secret sauce at Enda in the sense of we didn't know how to make shoes and the first order of business was getting someone who made shoes and someone who also understood the mission. Because if you don't understand the mission, you'll be like, why are you guys wasting your time in Africa? You just go to Taiwan or China and problem solve. And so it was important as well to get someone was able to do that. So we hit LinkedIn, actually LinkedIn was very useful. Uh, we also sent emails to all friends, whoever, like, hey, do you know someone who is in this particular skill set? We're, we're not just looking for uh, people who make shoes, but also people who have experience in selling, uh, running footwear, in digital marketing, in the running space, like we're looking for all these things. And in every conversation, it was always like, okay, thanks. Do who If you were me, which other three people would you talk to? And so as a result of that, we formed a really, really amazing and strong network. That's how we found that people that we found, like um, eventually all all the conversations led to the right people. And we were like, okay, so we have the designers, we have the uh, factory in China that's willing to help us do that. Let's get started. And so we were able to raise money from friends and family and also use a little bit of savings to get to the first prototype. And we were hoping we'd be able to get some financing now that we have a working prototype. You know, that's what everybody says, get the prototype, get the funding. And that wasn't necessarily it for us. First of all, it was, why are we making the product in Kenya? Like, why can Like, there was a lot of skepticism. It hadn't been done before. What makes you think you're so special that you could do this and others have failed? And things like that. And so we basically hit, we hit like several road bumps. And that's also part of the challenge of being an entrepreneur is like hearing no... I don't know, nowadays I feel like people really glorify, like, yeah, you just kind of need to go, 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 you know, but it hurts sometimes to kind of be, to have the door shut in your face over and over and over again. And so at some point we are like, okay, we need money. We're not going to get it from traditional financing. The VCs are either stringing us along or the nice ones are just upfront, like, yeah, no, we're not interested in this. And so... We figured out the best bet was to do crowdfunding. And I'm so glad we went down that path. I wouldn't change anything about it because I feel like that's how we started building our initial community of people or customers or frienders, as we call them, people who essentially support the brand. And Kickstarter was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of hard work. like, <laughs> uh, But it was great. First of all, it gave us money with no strings attached. So we could be able to execute as we wanted. It gave us a patient audience. Um, mostly people who are supporting on that platform know that it takes time to build product. So unlike someone who says, here's my money, I want my shoes tomorrow, the crowd on Kickstarter is more like, okay, here's the money. When do you think the shoes will be ready? So that bought us a lot of time to get started. And essentially, we started with money from Kickstarter, which was just enough to make the orders and a little bit more. And so we didn't have any shoes for returns and exchanges. And that's when I had to figure out how to deal with customers who are very angry and upset that the, they can't do exchanges. And there was nothing we could do, you know. But at least from an entrepreneurial side, we had established A, there was market. B, there was validation. We'd gotten media coverage from it. 
And even though we couldn't be able to, you know, meet all the customer demands, at least we established that there was a demand worth investing in. And that is how we launched both our first and our second shoes. That's a great story. And I love the fact that you talk about like, yeah, we tried to appeal to an investor lens. And when that sort of wasn't productive, you said, well, let's just go to the people who are going to buy this and let's ask them what they think. Yeah. Right. So I'm curious, you know, your, your your slogan is kind of run Kenyan. Maybe tell us a little bit about the shoes themselves. What's different about them? Is it design? Is it functionality? What what do you think is special about the Enda shoes? First of all, just I just realized I never mentioned what Enda means. Enda means go. Uh, it's a Swahili word that uh, you hear a lot when people are supporting their teams, especially in the most concluded Olympics. Whenever people are watching a sport towards when someone is either scoring or approaching the finish line, everybody will be like, Enda, 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 like go, 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 you know. And so that's what the company means. It means to go. And uh, as I said, it's inspired by Kenyan runners and basically trying to expand the ecosystem of that industry. Because again, as I said, I grew up in running country and there you, you realize just how much pressure these runners face. You know, you have one guy who's basically the one guy who's made it in a village and he has to support everyone. And there's this social expectations that we have back home where you, you know, your neighbor is you, their problem is your problem. And so while that is good from a development perspective, it really sucks if you're the guy who's the one with, you know, like with plenty than everybody, because then you're, you know, paying school fees, paying medical fees, paying anything that is needed in the community. And so I was like, we needed to expand the benefit of this industry and see how much further we could take it along so that in future there's lesser pressure on athletes. There's people who can, you know, gain work from it or benefit from being the supply chain or whatever, but just expand that business and see how it goes. And so, so Run Kenyan essentially is, it is our philosophy. It is the way the athletes live. If you see how athletes work together, right? It is the, what does it embody to make a champion? To make a champion means it's, it's a community, right? Uh, if you see how they live, they actually live in camps together. They go see their families, but everybody lives in the camp. And in the camp, it doesn't matter whether you're a champion. It doesn't matter whether you're an amateur. If it's your turn to clean the toilet, it's your turn to clean the toilet, you know? And so that spirit of brotherhood that if I cannot make it, then at least, you know, I'm coexisting with others. And that's what Run Kenyan means. Run Kenyan also means um, there's a quiet excellence, right? Like a lot of people just see the athletes on the podium. But we get to see them when they're waking up in those wee hours. Like when the cameras are not watching, it takes discipline, man. Like I don't even think I've achieved that level of discipline to be consistent at going on and on and on. And sometimes they get an injury or they get a setback that takes them like, how do you come back from that? And so what we've seen um, and what I really admire and what we want to embody as Run Kenyan is also the art of quiet discipline and quiet excellence that you kind of keep going because you know the path ahead of you and there's no distractions you know like even if you get an obstacle a you have your community but b the work is done away from the limelight and that's okay you know like you don't always have to be on the limelight and uh, lastly run kenyan is also about efficient running you know like um, there's different ways of running um there's hill strike midfoot strike there is an efficient way in which our bodies are created to run i mean um evolution has kind of mess that up with our diets and all the things that we do in our lifestyle but it's also how do we get people to run in their most efficient running form or at least get them to be knowledgeable about what it takes to be an efficient runner so that it's not just someone who's um, running but also kind of like punishing their body but running in a sense that is holistic and educational but this I mean now like running is really popular and everybody's running right but if you understand how running works, you also know that runners are also prone to injuries, especially knee injuries, uh, hip injuries. And if you are not aware of how you're running and the right tools, which I mean the right running shoes for that, then you might be kind of like high-fiving yourself and thinking, oh my God, what a mighty workout I did. But in essence, you've just been like tearing away at your muscles and your joints, you know. And so Run Kenyan is also about what does it mean that even sometimes you might want to be a runner, 
but it's okay to mix it with other sports, like just being aware of your body and saying, okay, maybe I'll walk and I'll swim. And that's perfectly fine because you understand the impact of, let's say, running on pavement and things like that. And so ultimately we want Run Kenyan to be the embodiment of all these things so that when people come, they come to run with joy. They come to have a running community. They come with patience and humility and excellence, like showing up. And as Enda means, you know, keep going. Nice. That's beautiful. I love that. Well, we're going to take another short break and we'll be right back with Navalayo Osembo from Enda. I love that I'm building something, most importantly, that really matters and that can change the world in a very relevant and necessary way. By being able to run my own business and be able to write my own check, as a lot of Americans would like to be able to do, I want to be able to be a bright, shining example of exactly how to make that happen. Hi, we're William and Garnett, founding partners of Aperture Venture Capital, VC for the multicultural mainstream. Aperture is a $75 million seed stage fund reimagining the startup landscape for diverse and female founders. If you're listening to this amazing podcast, you already know diverse and female founders have largely been ignored by the VC industry. Aperture is making it our mission. We want to elevate those voices. So if you're a diverse founder, we want to showcase your story. Come share your voice and your founder's journey at ApertureVC.com forward slash founders. That's A-P-E-R-T-U-R-E-V-C dot com forward slash founders. Thank you very much. So we're back with Navalayo from Enda. So tell us a little bit about the shoes themselves. Let's let's talk about like what's the design, what's the intent around what the shoe represents in terms of its differentiation in the marketplace because there's lots of running shoes out there in the world. What's different about uh, the end of shoes? So there's two things. First, there's the technical bit and then there's the aesthetic. The aesthetic, we try as much as possible to tell Kenyan stories through the shoe. Um, let me start with the aesthetic purpose. So first of all, if you... Um, read a lot of African history, you'll realize a lot of history was passed down orally. There wasn't really anything ever written to poem, dance, art, and things like that. And I do feel like we have to think about how to educate our current youth and the world at large about the African culture, but in a way that is honoring the process of communicating through symbolism. And so that's what we are doing with our shoes. Like every shoe is telling a particular story. So the first shoe we did was a lightweight trainer. It was called the E10. Iten is a place in the northwest Rift Valley of Kenya, and it has produced the largest number of world medal, like gold medal champions in distance running. And so when we name the shoe, someone will be like, what is Iten? That is an opportunity to educate, you know. And then you look at the colors. The initial colorways were red, green, and black, which was the colors of the flag. Our logo is the tip of a spear, which comes from the coat of arms. And it's also what a spear represents, you know, it's about swift motion, direction. You never see a spear that's crooked. It's always like, you know, super straight. And it's, it's what the brand is about, telling that Kenyan story as well. And we have the word Harambe at the bottom of all our shoes. Harambe means we all pull together. It's the national motto of Kenya. And it means if I cannot do it alone, the community will help me, which is literally the story of Enda. Like it was a crowdfunded campaign that came to life. And so that's why we basically make sure that we have the word Harambe at the bottom of each shoe. So the first shoe was a, a lightweight trainer and it is uh, intended for shorter distances. It is ideal for, although some people run with it marathons, but all our shoes are developed to enhance a midfoot strike, which is the most efficient running form. And also one of the things we try to honor is um, connectivity to the ground. So we have uh, low drop shoes. The first shoe, the E10, is a, has a four millimeter drop. A drop is essentially the distance between the heel and the, the part under the midfoot. And so we try to not go too much for stability and also to make sure that as much as possible, we are trying to get you to the ground and giving you just enough cushioning uh, uh, what you need in order to be able to connect to the ground. Uh, this again has historical meanings. The human species became Homo erectus, actually in northern Kenya. And so it isn't just about us trying to be fancy. It's literally Kenya is where we became bipedal, it's where we started running. And we try to honor that culture and also with how the athletes have shown us the best way to run by making sure the shoes are actually support a midfoot stance. The second shoe we, we had is a daily trainer. It's more cushioned 
it's for long runs, ideal for if you want to go like the long ride over a weekend or over a marathon. Uh, it is called the La Patette. La Patette is a word in Kalenjin that means run. And so when you are working with the athletes, it's a word you'll hear a lot, a lot. Everybody will be like La Patette and everybody sprints, you know. <laughs> and so again, an opportunity to to educate people about language, you know, and we designed it initially to be inspired by the natural features of Kenya and the uppers feature a wave. Uh, they have waves on the upper because the waves were things that you observe in nature, whether it's the wind uh, blowing over the savannah or the ocean or the sky, there's always an element of movement. And so that shoe was dedicated to that. We have evolved the second uh, storytelling for the La Patette has been the the birds of Kenya, uh, which is what we are doing. But ultimately, as I said, the products are about education. It's not just about, here's a product I want to wear. I do think in this world, we need empathy. And I do think empathy starts with knowing, seeing someone as a story, like understanding where they're coming from, what drives them, as opposed to just looking at each other and judging you know, each other by how it looks like. When you get to know what drives a people, what makes a people, I do think ultimately, that brings more empathy to the world, which is what we need. And that's what we want to achieve as a brand. Beautiful. I love the convergence of culture and design and utility. It's very intentional, which is a great story. So tell us about where is Enda today? I mean, is it, are you distributing online? Are you distributing in Africa, in Europe, other places? So and that today has evolved so much when I look at the beginning when it was just two of us answering emails, dealing with suppliers, uh, making sales, going to pop-ups, <laughs> like it was just two people. Uh, right now we've grown the team, we're about seven people. Full time we do have a uh, we do also work with part-time consultants who help us. We have workers at the factory who are also part-time but they work on our product as well. And so we started off, when we started off with Pixar, we actually had customers from 32 countries, which was a very quick lesson in logistics. And we were like, you know what, uh, bite what you can chew. And so we really scaled down to make sure that customers were getting the best experience and we focused on Kenya and the US because majority of our customers came from the US. However, now we are launching into Europe. We are still, you know, like working behind the scenes to make sure that works. But uh, Europe remains one of our uh, key markets and we want to see that grow, uh, the US as well. Kenya, we initially thought the uptake would be low just given the cost of running shoes, especially if you're making them from scratch and there's also the competition from secondhand products. But the market has also been doing really, really well. And we are working with our suppliers to come up with a shoe that is more sourcing more locally. And uh, when you source locally, it's basically cheaper. And that shoe is also something we're hoping to launch either in September or October. You can get products on our website. In the US, you can also find us on Zappos. Uh, we do, uh, they do stock our shoes and we do have some stores, although we are primarily D2C company. The stores are stores that stock our products, not really our stores, but as we grow, we're definitely looking to get into that space as well. So I'm curious, you're, you're the first company we've actually talked to from Kenya, ironically. How was the business, because the business has been around for uh, a few years now. Yeah. How was your business affected by COVID last year? COVID was actually a blessing for the running industry. If you look at the numbers, the running industry is like, it's thriving, you know. And one of the things, of course, is people became more aware of health. And I also think the fact that running was one of the activities that was kind of like allowed even during lockdown. Uh, in most countries made it an easier to fall back into. And again, all you need in running, unlike tennis, is a pair of good running shoes. <laughs> and so it's uh, one of the lessons I learned also about how do you make sports more accessible and running. You can run in anything, you know. Um, of course, we try to get people to be more aware of the like getting the right running shoes. But I've seen people just, you know, like run in anything. And so COVID was great, not just for Enda, but also for other running shoe companies in the industry. But in terms of like supply chain or, or your workers and disruptions, were, were there any impacts that came from that? Or maybe, maybe I don't know if you support or work with some of the, the elite runners there. I mean, a lot of events got canceled. I mean, the Olympics got delayed a, a whole year. Did that affect your business? I mean, I understand the demand side, but like on that other side, did you have any impact from that? Yeah, so one of the things we did 
when we figured something is definitely going on at the global stage, you know, and it's affecting China, uh, one of the things we did was to talk to our advisors. Uh, they, some of them have been through the dot-com bubble. They've been through the financial crisis and they were like, listen, when humans are stressed, running increases. It's just a correlation. We've been in this industry long enough to know that when there are stress factors that directly affect people, the running shoe industry really thrives. And so their advice uh, was stock up, you know, like make the orders as fast as you can, secure them, get them in the factory, make sure you're ready, which I'm forever grateful for because uh, I do have another person who owns a business, though in not in the sports and wellness industry. And their email, it was like a large SOS email. And they're like, guys, I love you guys. You're my friends. That's why I'm telling you, cut spending, um, you know, like reduce salaries, like just hunker down because it's going to be rough. And on the other hand, going to the advisory board and they're like, no, 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 like buy, buy, you know, like just make sure you're ready. And we were so glad we did that. So by the time the global supply chain was uh, kind of, um, you know, getting really thick things in, in terms of the supply chain, we had at least shipped our product out of China. And so when the pandemic hit, we were, we had shoes in store, which I have to say really worked in our favor. Uh, for the athletes, it was really hard. So a lot of events got cancelled, not just athletics, but generally all sports, unless you're like in esports or something like that. And so what we did for the athletes is first we uh, we did two things for athletes. First was to create projects that would, you know, didn't need a crowd, but would also help us elevate the brand. So we we chased the fastest known time to run up and down Mount Kenya. Uh, and discovered that the record was held by an Italian. And I was like, okay, I love Italy, guys. I what? absolutely do. <laughs> but this is Kenya. We kind of have to take that back. And so we actually had a really fun time going up and down North Kenya and kind of like breaking those records which our athletes did, which is amazing. And then um, for other athletes that were not part of our brand, uh, like we don't sponsor them directly. We gave them cash grants. We usually donate 2% of our revenues to community projects, but this time we decided instead of doing a project, let's just give direct cash grants. And that was really helpful for athletes whose income had been cut off uh, because at least we were able to give them some money to get by until things started picking up again. Nice. Wow. That's that's a great story. And it's interesting to hear as entrepreneurs who have gone through the last 18 months, two years, how they've reacted some have, you know, it's been crisis, some have been opportunity, some have been a mixture of both. And so, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a great story. And the fact that you're, you know, Harambe with, with other athletes, that's, uh, that's great. And a lot of people think, you know, in the United States, like the thought about being an elite athlete, whether you're professional or not, like if you reach the elite status, you're kind of taken care of one way or another. Sometimes you get endorsements, sometimes you get some opportunities to speak and you get paid for that. I mean, but I think what people don't understand is, you know, people who are maybe elite runners from Kenya don't necessarily have, you know, massive pot of gold waiting for them when they when they bring home the gold. Yeah. And I have to say, I've also discovered like that applies in the US as well. Uh, I was also under that assumption. But the more runners I meet, the more I realize, like, if you look at brand space, uh, brands really love to, you know, pick on the most successful athletes. And so you'll find on one end, there's an athlete with an over, with over demand and everybody wants to supply to kind of like get them. And they're athletes who basically have to do two shifts to be able to continue pursuing the sport. So there are a level of athletes where everybody is trying to get pro. Some will be good enough, but will never get pro, but they're still dedicated to the sports. And that's also something as Enda we want to change, whereas it doesn't have to be. And the world has shown us, if you look at TikTok, social media, you don't have to be the most famous, the most beautiful, the most, you know, you just have to, to be you, like be you and see how that comes. And I do think that is how the face of sponsorship is going to change. It won't necessarily be uh, the best athlete, but it also be uh, in terms of performance, but also the best athlete in terms of engagement and uh, fun, uh, yeah, basically fun engagement and how they're able to navigate the space as well. So that's something we're encouraging our athletes to do and basically saying you can turn pro and here's all the money or you may not turn pro, but here's how you can be able to, to do that. Sports can be really punishing if you if you don't make it uh, to the top. And we need to understand the pressure that that comes with. And yeah, hopefully change that 
you know, one athlete at a time. I love that. I mean, and in your perspective around it, it's almost like it's a company enveloped in a movement and a philosophy and a set of values, which is tremendous, tremendous to hear about. So what, what's success for Enda? Like if you look into the future, how will you define Enda as being a success? I want to be the top running shoe brand in the next three to four years because I think we can do it. And I definitely want that podium finish because I'm like, we can do it so, <laughs> so bad. Um, so definitely wanna, I want to see that. I also want to see more, um, I want Enda to be kind of like the de facto uh, shoe from Africa, you know, like the same way you'd land in Switzerland and everybody's in on, you know, like they're wearing on running shoes, the same way I want not just to be in Kenya, but in Africa as well, because I think in my view, Enda isn't about us, I think Enda represents a bigger a perspective of a brand that can actually start local and go global because we have a lot of perceptions. If you look at the top most um, brands in Africa, uh, I think only one was consumer and only the one that was African was MTN, which is a telco company. And so that also made me start thinking like, guys, come on, you Africans are being asked to look at the best brands and none of them are on the continent, you know, and things like that trouble me. And I think it's worth seeing it's worth showing people that it is possible. I do think once someone sees that, they're like, yeah, they did it, I can do it, you know. And so I want Enda to symbolize more than just a shoe company. I want it to be something that shows the possibility of what can happen, even in the midst of scarce resources, like resources aren't everything that you can still build a great company out of Africa. And, you know, don't really have to change, like still be the best version of yourself and tell your own stories. And of course, I want the athletes to be more like if I think of how the company should be, I want us to sponsor more athletes. I want us to invest more in community projects. I want, I want the ecosystem to grow. Some people would question that and say, well, that's not the best way to make business. But I do think my opinion is that we have seen from an African perspective, it's always been about extraction, right? And development equals to extraction. And, you know, refining and stuff like that. But the repercussions have been devastating. And I always feel like it doesn't have to be that way. It is possible to grow a company and grow the community and all stakeholders will be happy. It doesn't have to be shareholders. <laughs> it has to be <laughs> stakeholders. And so I think for me, that's the success I'm looking for where, um, you know, like there is much more space, much more opportunities in the running shoe industry for not just Kenyans, but people from around Africa and around the world uh, because of our existence. And yeah, that would make me really happy. Amazing. I love that. I love that vision. This has been an awesome conversation. My, my last question is, we'd like to ask if you could go back in time and speak to the pre-ENDA version of NAVA, uh, what kind of advice would you give her? What, what things would you tell her to to run towards, to watch out for? That's actually a good question. I would say, don't be busy, right? I would say, focus on what is core to the company, like, which are just three things. Make sure sell shoes grow the community, that's it, you know? And so I feel like sometimes you get so exhausted and bogged down trying to do everything. And I would say, just focus on those three things. Um, I would also say uh, more work-life balance, you know, like start putting the habit <laughs> in advance because you're not going to do so well at that. So try try to put the the balance up front. And I would say, I know it's cliche, but I would say you've got this. I look at my journey and I always see there were so many moments of doubt that I was like, I'm going to do it anyway. And I did. And so I should believe that if those moments worked, this is no different. Like I'm going to do it anyway. And it will work. I love that. And that's the kind of confidence that you have to call upon, right? Sometimes, you know, like you said, sometimes you go through these seasons where you get a bunch of no's, right? And it starts to hurt. It starts to become like, wait a minute, is this the evidence that we don't have something here? Or, right? That is true. So you have to have that confidence about like, yeah, we've, we've gotten through this before or we've gotten through other equally challenging times. Um, and so that's great. Uh, and work-life balance is a particularly important for the long haul that startups are right you can do anything for a long for a, for a short amount of time you know sleepless nights and things like that that is true it's not sustainable 
Well, this is awesome. And I'm, I'm so excited for you. So tell us, how can our audience be helpful to you, Nava, or to Enda? First of all, just follow us on social media, Instagram. Uh, we are Enda Sportswear, uh, E-N-D-A and Sportswear. I do think it's always great to, you know, like first get to know us. Uh, I would have loved to say go buy the shoes, but I'm like, get to know us first. <laughs> because I, what we want to do is create a community of runners. And I do think it's great for people to understand and believe our philosophy. And then, of course, ra- uh, purchase our shoes, uh, be part of the Ender community, sign up for the Ender Foundation. Every person who buys a shoe kind of gets to sign. And this is amazing because you get to decide uh, which projects in Kenya we are going to fund. And it's usually based on previous customer feedback. That's like the place that people absolutely love when it comes to kind of seeing that story and contributing and saying, okay, I really want these guys to get the money or not these other guys. And sometimes we've even found people who said, okay, my people didn't find the money, but I'm going to fund them anyway. You know, I do think ultimately it is the human and the empathy stories that we want to to get people to communicate and kind of like remove all these biases and obstacles that are in our thoughts. Yeah, I'd say that. And of course, you know, just tell a friend about us. Uh, walk up to someone and say, hey, did you know there's a running shoe company in Kenya that's called Enda? That's a really, really great conversation starter. So (laughs) you'll be surprised. That's a great call to action. I love that. Go tell a friend. It'll definitely spark a conversation. I would almost guarantee it. Absolutely. Well, Namalayo, this has been so great. I really appreciate you taking the time and your story is amazing. And uh, we look forward to hearing more from you maybe in the future. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I've enjoyed this immensely. We'd like to thank our guest, Nabalayo Osembo, and our sponsor, Aperture VC. This podcast was produced by me with additional audio editing and production by We Edit Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or simply go to foundersunfound.com forward slash listen to, that's listen T-O, and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn at Founders Unfound. Thanks so much for tuning in. I am Dan Kihanya, and you've been listening to Founders Unfound.